TV English, the solution for humanity. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and welcome to another episode in the series Dawa Ilallah. We are continuing with our series at looking at what are the requirements that we need to have in our life as those who call to the submission to Allah. We are calling people not to a new club, we're not calling them to a new organization, we're not calling them to a new religion, we are calling them to submit to the one true God for their own benefit, to help them become better, more powerful, more stronger people than they were ever before, more than they ever thought they could be. So this is the idea of calling people to Allah, not because of any other reason other than to improve their lives in, here, in this part of, of their existence and in the life to come. And so we've been looking at some of the characteristics that a da'i should have when he calls people to submission to Allah. And one of those is that he should have a true belief system based on the fact that he himself actually believes in what he is talking about. He has to believe in Islam. It's no use telling people to come to Islam, you don't believe in it yourself. A da'i should have very good manners. In other words, he should have a good character. When people look at him, he must be the type of person that they want to emulate. They want to become like him. And the third thing that we looked at is that he needs to have a decent amount of knowledge that he has acquired over a period of time. Not just Islamic knowledge, but knowledge about a vast variety of subjects. Even the boring subjects. Even finding out what mathematicians are up to. It's very, very important for us to figure out and understand what is going on. It's become very easy in this day and age to gain a decent education because we can just go to YouTube you can type in science and religion, maths and religion, biology and religion, and you'll get all the latest stories that are going on in the world. And then you can get from that a spin-off where you'll be able to go, okay, let me go find those books or find that. What about what's happening in politics? Same type of thing. So it's easy for us to gain knowledge and learn how to find out information on a vast variety of topics. Do not only have e-books or PDF books. You need a hard copy book in your house. There's nothing better than having a hard copy book that you've written in the margins and you've written everything and you put notes in and you've got newspaper cuttings that you've stuck into that book. It makes it more relevant. And then when you pick up that book, it's nice to be able to get a reminder of all that information that you've gathered. And one of the things that I like to do whenever I visit somebody's house is ask them for their Quran. Do you know why I ask them for their Quran? because I want to see what condition it's in. Most people's houses, would you like me to come to your house and ask for your copy of your Quran? Would you like me to come to your house? What condition would your Quran be? Would it be as crisp as the day you bought it? The page is still all stuck together. Or would it be all filled with finger marks everywhere for over the years of reading it? With little pieces of paper stuck in it, with little markings on the side and the margin where you've written ideas or thoughts that you've learned. If it is nicely and intact still, that means it's never been used. So we want to make sure that that Quran that you have at home, the one that you're using to study, the one that you're using to learn, the one that you're learning how to get closer to Allah from, should be full of information, full of notes on how to become a better, stronger, more powerful Muslim. And then today we are going to be moving on to the next section that is found in Islam of how to be a good da'i or how to be effective in the work of da'wah. And that is that if you want to be an effective da'i, you need to join with Muslim organizations. Okay, now already a lot of people are saying, the Muslim organizations in my area, you should see what they like. 
nobody would want to join up with our Muslim organizations. But we need to join up with Muslim organizations. There's a number of reasons why it's beneficial as a da'i for you to connect with Muslim organizations. If you don't want to work with one, work with many of the different Muslim organizations. First thing, you'll be able to get some free resources. You'll be able to get free Qurans, free books, everything from that, because they say, well, this guy's doing our work for us. And so they will give you books and they'll give you things to hand out. Secondly, you'll be able to get questions answered. If somebody asks you a tough question, you don't know how to answer it yourself, by going to those organizations, they will be able to give you some information, maybe train you up. And there's also a benefit of perhaps they will actually want you to come and help them in their organization or even work in their organization sometime in the future. We'll find that many, many organizations where Da'is have been on their own, doing their own work, connect with an organization. Eventually that organization says, why don't you come work for us full time? So it's good for you to be connected to an organization. It's an important part of Da'a. It gives you strength and support as a Da'i. You've got a support structure behind you. You've got someone to help you. And this is what Allah Ta'ala has wanted us to do anyway. This is what we find in the pages of the Quran in chapter 3, verse 104, where it says, There shall be a group of people amongst you who invites towards good. So it's not a solo sport. It's not you on your own one-man show, us four and no more. It's a group of people working together. Sometimes we look at Da'is and they're like the frozen chosen. You have like three of these guys, they're like the pillars of the Da'i society and they go out and like, you know, what, the famous four. What's it called? The Magnificent Four. All the superheroes. Fantastic Four. You don't want to be the Fantastic Four, like the whole country, like the Fantastic Four, the same old four guys, always in every newspaper article, in every television interview, in every radio station. It's like the Fantastic Four, huh? Isn't it like that in most countries in the world? Us four and no more? No, it mustn't be like that. There should be hundreds of thousands of Da'is. There's a person that I know, uh, I don't really know him very well, but I've spoken to him a few times, in Durban where I live in South Africa. He's got a shop where he sells bedding and he sells cushions and whatever, all, such, all that type of stuff. But his shop is like a Dawa center. The windows, everywhere you look on the windows is La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, how to take the shahada, the basics of Islam, Surah Miriam, oh, every spot he's got available, there's something there. And he's just selling stuff. He doesn't even talk to people. The windows are doing the talking for him. The shop is doing the talking for him. And people come there, ask questions. What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? Go to that center. They will answer the question. He doesn't answer anybody. So he's like the middleman. You know, he just pushes people left. He's doing so much. That way he doesn't realize all the rewards he's getting. So it's the normal business people out there, the guy at the small little shop, the guy at the petrol station, they are doing the dawah. They're doing far more dawah. So don't underestimate the work that you are doing at home. You are doing more work and we are just there to sign the deal. Yes, we've got an important role to play. Yes, we have an important task to fulfill in life. But you, the guys, are doing all the hard work and, and may Allah guide you and bless you for the work that you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. So when we look at Doing da'wah and being an effective da'i, you have to join up with Muslim organizations. It's part of Islam that we need to have a group of people working together. It's not good to be one man cowboy, you know? We're not riding out into the sunset on a horse by ourselves and going, who was that masked man? We're not the Lone Ranger. You know, remember the Lone Ranger when you were kids and you'd ride off at the end of the program into the sunset and then the people, would, the narrator would say, who was that masked man? And then we'll go to another adventure. We not, mustn't be Zoros and we mustn't be Lone Rangers. We must be working as a team, as a collective force, working together and not try to do it on our own. In chapter 3 of the Quran, in verse 103, it says, Hold tight to the rope of Allah. We need to work together. A rope is not, it doesn't say hold tight to the thread. It says hold tight to the rope. The rope is thick. It's made up of lots and lots of strands all bound together. So this is what we are holding on to. We must work together as a group. You've all seen that story where they take a twig and they break it. Easy to do and they put two and it's a little bit more difficult. And you put six and it's almost impossible to break. We've all seen that. But this is so true. We need to work as a team. Work with a group of people all working together will make your dawah more effective. Another important issue, move on to the next point 
that this book has raised about how to be an effective da'i because we are dealing with a book, how to do da'wah calling to Allah. And so the fifth point this writer has brought up in his book, a da'i must strive for self-purification. I know it sounds like a very new agey term. He must try to be a person who tries to purify himself. A da'i's work is to help himself become a better Muslim in the process of helping somebody else come into Islam. And so he must never be a person who tries to belittle or knock down others along the way. He must be very unselfish. We must make sure that we become self-purifying. That we look at ourselves and go, I am only concentrating on what my task is. I don't care that he is having more success. SubhanAllah, may Allah reward him that a hundred people became Muslims through him. And this is something that I don't like. But this is my own pet hate, if you want to put it. It's when people put on their websites or people put on their advertising. This brother had a hundred people that took shahada in one day. He had 700 people that he led to Islam last month or last year. I think that is very, very arrogant to do. It's very distasteful. It's not the right way to do things. We shouldn't have a little black book that we have in our pocket and we go, that was another one for me. <laughs> you know, it mustn't be like that. It's not you who led anyone to Islam anyway. And if that's what you want to do, that was your reward. SubhanAllah, I congratulate you that you brought 700 people to Islam. Well done. You did a good job. But that's the end of your reward. You're not going to get anything in the hereafter. You've got it already. You've got the praises of people. Don't let people know. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. There's a Christian say that as well. Don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. Do it for the sake of Allah. If 500 people became Muslims, so what Allah? Marriage or divorce? What's Islamic ruling? Nikah. Solution or problem? Heaven or hell? Uh, there is a misconception. You choose. Beauty, wealth, family status, virtue. Decide what you want. Decide your choice. Be sad or be happy. It's your choice. Join Dr. Zakir Naik in Better Half or Bitter Half every Friday at 6.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 9.30 a.m. UK on Peace TV. Peace TV presents over 100 million viewers at one of the largest peace conferences in the world addressing a sea of spellbound spectators over 30 world-renowned orators on Islam with credentials impeccable. The truth of Islam. Deen is your way of life. It is our duty, our obligation. By following the Quran and Sunnah, we will give the message to one and all, one and all. With articulation exquisite. Read the book of Allah. Islam is the easy way, it's the simple way. Remind each other. The Muslim is not a source of harm for other people. Collaborate with the people for good. This is the call of Islam. With the mission of spreading the truth of Islam. Do what you can to spread the word of Islam. Wherever we are, live like Muslims. Use your power. Allah is saying, why do you need anything else? This Quran is self-sufficient. The only book on the face of the globe, the Quran. How a human being should lead his life is given in this instruction manual, manual the glorious Quran. The glorious Quran. For peace to prevail on earth in peacemakers, next on Peace TV. We shouldn't have a little black book that we have in our pocket and we go, that was another one for me. <laughs> you know, it mustn't be like that. It's not you who led anyone to Islam anyway. And if that's what you want to do, that was your reward. SubhanAllah, I congratulate you that you brought 700 people to Islam. Well done. You did a good job. But that's the end of your reward. You're not going to get anything in the hereafter. 
you've got it already. You've got the praises of people. Don't let people know. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. There's a Christian say that as well. Don't let the left hand know what your right hand is doing. Do it for the sake of Allah. If 500 people became Muslims, what Allah? You had a question, brother. Sorry, Sheikh. The thing is, sometimes when you work for the organizations and somebody takes shahada, they want to see how you're doing as being a da'i or whatever, because they give you a salary also. Yes. So in that case, is it okay to let them know or what should be your approach? Okay, if you're working for a Muslim organization and the Muslim organization is paying you according to how many people you bring to Islam, if they do that, get out of that organization. Some organizations, I know they do that. They say to the guy, you have a quota. If you don't bring so many people to Islam, then we're not going to keep you as a day. That is wrong. Get out of that organization. That is disgusting. That is just as bad as what the Christians have done. But if you work for a Muslim organization, or an imam of the mosque, or whatever it is, and somebody comes to take shahada with you, you need to keep a record. There needs to be a very structured, as we'll talk about in the series, you need to have a structured piece of, of paper, has their name on it, has the address on it, has their telephone number on it, has what their previous religion was, when they took shahada, what name they've chosen. They need to have an indemnity form on the back of that piece of paper that says, if I die, I hereby give this organization authority to bury me as a Muslim. They must sign that. They need to give you a copy of the identification and a photograph. That must be stuck. It must be a legal document. Why? Do you know how many Christians and Hindus have been Muslims for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years? They die. Their Christian family, Hindu family claims their body. We have no right over the body because there was no paperwork. So I am fully behind paperwork. This is not what I'm talking about by bragging. I'm saying the da'is that are well known, you don't use that as an advertising tool by saying how many people you have. We have in our office, we have a card where we fill out all that data, goes into a file, and it sits in a file. I don't know how many names there. I don't care how many names there are because I don't do all that work. Somebody else does all that paperwork. If I'm on the road and somebody does it, that local community that they come from, I send them to them, and that local community keeps all that paperwork. So I don't keep a tally of everything, you understand? But it's important that you give. So you would report back to your organization. Today, when we were out talking, there were six people who took shahada. Here are their forms. Here is their details. Put that on file. Um, some of the records go back 10 years, and some of my records go back that late. So the card-keeping system is good because you can also have a section at the bottom there where you have a one-year plan. Remember I told you about the one-year plan? And then you can phone them once a month, say, so where did you go for lunch this month? And he said, I went to John, Michael, Peter, whoever it is, to Iqbal's house, I went to Arib's house, I went to Zakia's house, and then you would tick it off on the bottom, all four houses he went to. Remember we spoke about how you can divide the whole year up into the revert going and visiting 52 different places throughout the year. Once a week, a different person. Only one person per week, easy. One person, very easy to do. So this is what you would have on that form. Very, very important to have. Must be structured. No use taking shahadas from, okay, now I finish my talk. Anybody wants to become a Muslim, please come stand here. We'll take your shahada, give them each a Quran. We say, subhanAllah, everyone claps, everyone goes to takbir, and then we leave. So who's following up on that, brother? Who's following up on that, sister? Where's the follow-up? If I'm there and there are some Americans that came to the talk, and they revert to Islam, and I say, good, fine, give them their Qurans and leave. And I come back two years later and I, find, I say, what happened to those guys? I say, what guys? I don't know anything you're talking about because there's no follow-up done. There's nothing written down. This has happened a few times. So now we don't do that. When we go and do dawah classes or dawah lectures, in South Africa, I do a seven-day dawah course. Two days of dawah, five days of preparation. Two days we actually do the dawah course where people come to learn how to do dawah. Five days is preparation of the Muslim community for the two days. Why? Because they need to know what do you do when people take shahada? What are we going to do when people embrace Islam? How are you going to look after them? What are the infrastructures you have in place? Let's get the funding together. Let's get a hall together. All that has to be done before I even talk. Because it's pointless talking and none of the preparations have been done. So when you have a visiting dawah talker coming to do dawah in your area, he must be there before to train you up on how to deal with the situation. You know he's coming for a two-day talk. 
So those of you, brothers and sisters, who are involved in Dawa and doing Dawa lectures in your country, seven days, not one day talk, seven day talk. You need to prepare the community you're going to at least for four or five days before you go there. Be around for a day or two after your series has finished or your Dawa program has finished to be there as a guide to show the community how you look after those who have reverted. Very, very important to have structure in Islam. This haphazard version of Dawah is what is not working. It has not worked. You saw the way the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and the Sahaba looked after, may Allah be pleased with all of them, how they looked after the people who came in. They had a structure. They had a plan. They would go into an area with a plan. There were certain places they didn't go to because they didn't have a plan yet. They didn't move into an area until they had a plan for that area. What are we going to do when we get there? How are we going to look after that community? What Have we got uh, people that are permanently going to be there for them? So there has to be structures in place before we just go do dawah for the sake of doing dawah. There has to be a proper plan. Like you would have a country having a war cabinet. They would sit down and have the general of the military. You have the general of the air force. You have the general of the infantry. You have the general. All of these guys would sit there and they'd look at this war plan. And they'd have this map and they'd have these little miniature ships and boats and tanks and everything. We must have the same war cabinet, a Dawa war cabinet that meets and says, okay, so what have we got for those people who are, are going to be doing Dawa in this area? Who's all going to come aboard? Okay, who's got the Arabic guy? Arabic guy, come stand here. What is your plan for teaching Arabic to the guys once they revert? Okay, you're the fifth department. Come here. Fifth department, what is your one-year plan that you have for those who come into Islam? The sisters, what are you going to do with the sisters that are coming to Islam? What about the dietary plan? Who's going to be dealing with that? Who's going to be teaching how to prepare yourself when you go to the bathroom? All this has to be decided before a Dawa program even starts. So you have to have your war cabinet together. And you have a plan and you go there not haphazardly and just do Dawa and then hope that the guy's going to figure it all out on his own. I know people who've reverted to Islam that still do not know how to do Istinja. No one's ever taught them. And these guys have been Muslim for 10 years, if not more. No one's told them. There are Muslims that I've come across who don't know how to read Surah Fatiha yet, that have been Muslims more than 10 years. This is because there was no war cabinet, a strategy plan, before you went in. What is the long-term goals of Dawah? You cannot just go and do a Dawah course. In 2011, I refused to go and do any talks unless it was for seven days or more, or dawa, like one day dawah program or two day dawah program, unless we had those five days of preparing. You have to prepare the crowd, the audience, and we had more success that way because the follow-up was done, everybody looked after them, the community became stronger, the centers remained more powerful. So you have to do things in a structured way. Dr. Zakia Naik is known to be very structured in the way he does things. He has these big lists. Sometimes they look to us like, wow, are there these lists? But he has a method. He has a methodical way of making sure that things are done. It's a checklist. It's a responsibilities list. It's to make sure that nothing is just done hazardly. I want to know where you were, why you did this, how, what is the plan for the future? And maybe it can aggravate people, but it's better that way than just doing things randomly for the sake of doing it and not knowing where you're going. You need to have an end goal in sight. We need to plan everything in advance. So this is what we are talking about when we're talking in this section about self-purification, where we have to make sure that we are prepared in ourselves when we do dawah. Because remember we spoke about last week, how you have to do this as a team. You have to structure yourself with an organization, if possible. And then on you, once you've done that, you need to purify yourself by having all these systems in place, all these checks and balances to make sure everything works according to the way Allah would be pleased, how he would want it to be done. And then we will find that we will be able to stay on a path of success in the work that we do in Dawah. Because remember, Allah has given us this responsibility to call people to success. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode again. If you want to join us again, make sure you join us again on Peace TV. So for me, Arabi Islam, and everyone else here, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
The value of money in the hereafter will be measured by its proper use in the present. According to the glorious Quran, one of the best ways to use your money is to spend it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by spreading his message of Islam. Beast TV is a non-profit Islamic satellite television channel that is primarily dedicated for just that cause. The proper presentation of Islam. It's a great choice to invest in it and a golden opportunity to purify your wealth in a way that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Support Peace TV. Send your zakat and donations to IRFI Al Ryan Bank, 47 Calthorpe Road, Birmingham, UK, B151TH. Pound account number 011 IBAN GB49ARAY. 3008301132301 sort code 300083 swift bic code ARAY gb 22 please confirm your contribution at support at peace tv tv support peace tv the solution for humanity Puri class is the touchstone of theology Theology means the study of God. Puri class is the litmus test for the study of God. It is the 112 chapter of the Quran, verse number 1 to 4. Kul hu Allahu ahad. Say is Allah, one and only. Allah who summoned. Allah, the absolute, the eternal. Lam yaliz walam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. Walam yakullahu kufu an ad. There is nothing like unto him. It's mentioned. In Sayyid al-Bukhari, Volume 6, Book of Virtues of the Quran, Hadith number 5013, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Surah Ikhlas is equal to the one third of the Quran. There are four criteria for the verification of the true God. The first is Ahad, the one and only. The second is As-Saman, the absolute, the eternal. The third is Lam yalit, walam yulat. He begets not, nor is he begotten. The fourth is, walam yakullahu kufu an ad. There is nothing like unto him. Verify today whether the God you are worshipping is true or not with the help of Surah class, the touchstone of theology. <laughs>